there, my name's Jill Tiny, I'm from Collaboration Global, and this is our podcast, Being Human, Hidden Depths. I'm going to be interviewing some of our members from Collaboration Global, and they're going to be sharing with you their extraordinary lives. Although they would probably believe they're just normal, everyday, average humans, but they are extraordinary. A bit like you and me, we all have our story to tell. We've all been through difficult times and we've come out the other end having learned an extraordinary amount about ourselves that we can share with others. So I think you'll find lots of things that will resonate with where you've been in your journey as well. I look forward to seeing you on the other side. Hello and welcome to the Collaboration Global session uh, podcast of being human hidden depths it's friday afternoon i'm just trying to think <laughs> what we're doing here today um so my name is jill tiny uh, and i'm pleased to say i am joined by one of our old hands at collaboration global in fact i believe this is your second uh, podcast with us david so we can go a little bit deeper but welcome onto the podcast david little hello <laughs> with a beautiful sunshine behind old you hands. if only I, was... I should be young hands not old hands <laughs> Experienced hand. Let oh, me use my words carefully. Experienced <laughs> hand. <laughs> Not old soul, you flip it out. You're, you're still in, in short trousers. <laughs> literally. Oh, literally. <laughs> yeah, but, but not wet behind the ears, that's for sure. Um, one of the things that, David, um, I particularly enjoy about your membership within Collaboration Global is that although you do th- this thing of um, finance as a day job, very rarely do people find out about that about you until they're like two or three months into their membership and they go oh I thought he I thought he did scout well yeah he does that as well oh I thought he did that sailing thing yeah he does that as well doesn't he do that kind of marathons yeah he does that as well and they hadn't kind of cottoned on that oh yeah this is how he earns his money so mm. do, do you keep those two things kind of really separate or or do you just see them as you know I'll talk about what I want to talk about um it is well it isn't it, it isn't it sorry it is and it isn't separate um uh, ultimately it's the the whole uh, the whole who are you and what do you do really um my work is uh, yeah I, it's it's a career that i'm in i dress in a certain way because there's an expectation that's carried uh, that's carried with that um if i turn up in t-shirt and shorts um certain clients wouldn't would probably not perceive the conversation in the same way um, certainly until I've been talking for 20 minutes and then it's pretty obvious um, I know what I'm talking about. But um, um, I, yeah, I would, I would say it is kept separate, um, not not necessarily deliberately, um, but I, you know, I, I give a lot of time and effort to, to clients during the week. And, you know, when we're, we're kind of on it, we're, we're, we're fairly heavily on it, aren't we? Mm. And if we're not working, then we're not, you know. Um, so in no in, in no uncertain terms, uh, you know, if it's the weekend or, or outside working hours, I'm not in a suit carrying a laptop and, you know, research material and chatting about yeah. interest rates and stuff. That's just that would be unnatural. Yes, because it's not a necessarily Hopefully. a natural conversation when you're down the pub, is it? Oh, what interest rate are you paying on your mortgage at the moment? You know, it's like, mm. no, it isn't. It isn't. It isn't. It isn't. It, it's. Mm. There's a time and a, there's a time and a place. Everybody's got an a, everybody's got an opinion um, about finances, especially in a pub. But most mm. of them are incorrect, um, and a lot of the time it's, it's easier just to avoid having those conversations because they're generally not correct. Um, you don't necessarily win any favors by putting people right um, in that capacity. But if it's in a professional capacity, that's a wholly different conversation. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Because they're, they're coming to you with that, you know, you've got the wisdom and I'm sitting here listening. We're in, in a pub environment. It's like, oh, no, my, my window yeah, the, told me so you can get yeah, this mortgage. The, <laughs> the dynamic's completely different. Yeah, um, so yeah. I, I think the question really should have been is are the dynamics kept separate? And in that in, in that environment, absolutely, definitely. Mm. Um, uh, and it's also it's also quite nice to do that because a lot of mental energy goes into that side of things. And it's, it's nice to be able to switch off. That's a really good point, actually. It's, it's a holistic um, sanity, isn't it? If you're using your brain a lot during the week, you have to get physical to kind of blow the cobwebs away in order to kind of yeah. balance the, the the dynamic. As you say, it's, it's a dynamic. Do you feel it's a, an ageist industry? Because I imagine when you started, a lot of people might have looked at you and gone, oh, he's young. What does he know? 
Um, but now, uh, yeah, uh, yes, and <laughs> yes, yeah, yes, I know. I would say it's established knowledge biased. Um, I think, and it's also the uh, it, it's also the way that you put yourself across and have conversations. I had a really good chat with Claire this morning. Oh yeah, um, and mm-hmm. was just discussing um, the communication dynamics between the different people in our industry. Um, so solicitors, uh, estate agency, property people, uh, more finance people. Um, and it was a really interesting conversation because I think people either get it and they understand how it should be done um, and, you know, what goes into making that happen um, or they don't. And if they don't, it's actually very difficult to explain how it should be unless you drag them through um, a, a, a bad experience. And I always maintain that we should never, ever have any client have a bad experience if we do the job properly. Um, now, I, I still stand by that because mm. people don't have to they don't have to have a, a bad experience to understand what you do um, and how well you do it. Um, but occasionally it does happen when it does happen, when things do go wrong. Um, typically, after having said, <laughs> I have warned you. Um, then, um, yeah, you know, whenever whenever we're in a position to say, I told you so, that, that doesn't help. That's not a constructive thing no, to do. No, no, absolutely. Um, it should always be kind of proactive and, and massively collaborative. It was, as I said, it was really interesting to talk to Claire um, and talk to somebody who really does kind of live and breathe that understanding because so many people don't. Oh, tell me about it. I mean, from my own experience last year, I said to Claire, why didn't I meet you last year? Um, because we, by the time you got the estate agent and the solicitor and the financial advisor and the, you know, the person that deals with your pension and all the yeah, way down. It's joining you up, isn't it? Oh, it's agony. Just trying to, you know, asking you questions. And I've already answered that. And it's like, oh, well, I haven't got yeah. it here. Can you send me the information again? Oh, okay. So because you're too inefficient to get it organized, then I've got to spend my time doing this again. And I'm paying you for this. It was yep. a very weird scenario. Um, so yeah, Claire has um, got her work cut out to get the lines of communication going smoothly between those particular people. Um, one of the things I love about you, David, is your joie de vivre for life, uh, but also the way your involvement with the Scouts and indeed with your own kids not only gets you out and about, but you've got an attitude towards adventure and trying stuff. And you only live once, the old YOLO. Um, and we're often told, looking at finance, that oh, these kids should be taught this stuff at school. Um, what stuff is entirely, I'm not too sure. Um, and they are taught some, and I think people forget that um, there is an element of numeracy that they are taught that should equip them for some of the stuff that we have to learn later on. Mm-hmm. Um, who do you think is responsible? So, I mean, how much do you teach? I mean, how old are your children for start to tell everybody, but also how much do you teach them about what you know about looking after the pennies? Well, it's four or nine, I think, is a little a little young to be expecting them to pay their way and, uh, and pay rent. <laughs> however, <laughs> however... <laughs> Uh, as soon as that is viable, that's happening. Um, no, it's. Uh, I, I think it's. I think it, it's. It's a school's responsibility in some aspect. Um, I think it's also a parent's responsibility to instill certain values. Um, I think uh, it, that nothing beats actually young people going out and earning money. I mean, I did it. Um, I mean, it's not like I was going down the mines or anything, so it's not like it was difficult in comparison mm-hmm. to what previous generations have done. Um, but I think, I think, um, I think all young people should, in some way, be uh, be earning money in some way to teach them a value. Um, and but at the same time, even if they're not earning that, values I think very much come from um, from friends and family and, and the environment in which they're in. Um, so just because someone doesn't necessarily have a job doesn't by definition mean they they won't value money or, or value what they have in the world um yeah it's, it's not there's not it's not cut and dry because people come from so many different places and um, and have so many different experiences along the way and different people have a very very different attitude as to what is of value mm-hmm. um some people value pounds and pence other people don't um some of the happiest people i've ever met in my entire life live out the back of a van paragliding their lives they are not interested in anything else um, that's great. Um, other people um, are, are only happy um, when they're counting pounds and pennies in bank accounts and count, literally counting houses. Yeah, I, don't, I, I would um, beg to argue that they're not actually happy. That's what they do. And they feel satisfied that they've achieved something. But whether that actually gives you ongoing happiness, I'm not 
too sure but that's a, that's a different conversation say, isn't it? yeah that's a yeah. whole other that's a whole other chat <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a, friend, a friend of mine at the age of 50 sold her house got herself a camper van and went around you know around europe i think she went um i know she did the uk and i think she went off on to europe as well but it's it's having that um no need of stuff i think is really useful um and if people are constantly craving that if i'm not on the property ladder um mm. i'm missing out if I'm not on the property ladder, um, I won't survive. I need to be in that space in order to be of value. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, how do you feel if your kid said to you, oh, dad, I'm going to live in a tent. I'm not going to buy a place. Um, well, I, kn I, know, um, I know the value because I've seen the value um, of parents um, giving their kids a certain amount of money at a younger age. Um, and getting them on the housing ladder. I mean, it's a, it may if you get them on the housing ladder as early as possible, um, it quite literally is life changing. Um, long term, it's it's life changing financially. So I think it is. I think that's incredibly important. Um, I, I I think parents. Uh, there's a lot of parents think that their kids should struggle to get from A to B because they have, um, and maybe that's maybe in a positive sense. Um, looking for the positive intent behind that maybe it's just them making sure that their kids grow up valuing things um you know so some kids are are, are feel they're entitled mm. others don't it, it depends on their backgrounds yeah it's interesting isn't it how some people are given everything on a, a golden platter and it it makes life harder for them in the long run in a, an ironic way they have no because resilience they have no resilience and they have no satisfaction in what they do. And you can yeah. understand why millionaires and billionaires will say to their kids, off you go, go and do it on your own. But yeah. there is always this kind of um, beautiful silk cushion for them to fall back on. So it's not like they are dire um, where, you know, when you sort of pulled yourself up from your bootstraps, hello, um, and you've, you've done it for yourself. So I had a mortgage at 18. Um, and it was very much a work ethic if you get out there. Why do you want to go to university? Don't do that. That's ridiculous. Go and earn some money, um, which, you know, we did. And now at the other end of the scale, it's like, OK, we're comfortable. Thank you. I'm wondering whether in the current climate things will change because people will kind of rebel against that um, ball and chain that, of a mortgage that you have. Well, it's not necessarily a ball and chain. It's no worse than paying rent. So financially, on a monthly basis, it's no worse than paying rent. I think it's uh, it's definitely better to get on the it's definitely better to get on the property ladder at some point. Um, how the the debt is viewed uh, is it viewed as something positive, as you're leveraging money that you've got to get yourself on the housing ladder, um, or is it viewed as a debt and you know it, it's a, a you know a horrific thing? Um, it, it's a positive thing to be on the housing ladder. It's just is that appropriate for you at any at any given time? And that will change. We're all different. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And in fact, looking at cultures, uh, you go to other countries and different cultures um, and, you know, the, the children don't leave home. <laughs> you know, they just move to a different floor of the house. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. it's like the, the mum just you know gets moved up and the kids just stay there. And, and it just the the style of the house and, and how it's orchestrated, it changes. I mean, my my dad um, lived in a rented accommodation and his family was so large, they had to have two houses next door to each other. Um, the mum and dad lived in one with the daughters and, and all the brothers lived in the one next door. Um, and they all sort of came together for meals and it was like one big house, but um, two separate houses. And when I told my dad at 18, I was going to get a mortgage. He said, I was in his words, you are potty, stark staring mad. Why would you yeah. want to go and do that? He was pretty very happy with what he had. Um, yeah, I mean, at that point, he actually had just paid off his mortgage, ironically, but he got that by accident rather than design. So he never planned. Long story. I won't go into it. Um, but yeah. So how many years ago was that? A lot. A long. I'm not going to say a long. A lot of years that the culture was almost you rent, you don't buy. People like us don't buy. You rent. But in many in many other countries, the culture is that you rent because the rent's cheaper and that you have uh, you have a family uh, a family weekend house that everybody goes to the weekend. So it's. Mm. You know, it, it's it's just it's just different places i wonder um, if, if here now because it is becoming so difficult for young people to get onto that property ladder wherever they are in the country i mean you go down to cornwall there's some very for you know we all want to buy a place in cornwall yes it's beautiful but there's parts of it that are so poor because of this problem with you know the cost of living has gone up because of all the outsiders coming in yeah 
I wonder whether people will now choose to stay at home for longer and or, you know, not necessarily go that far away um, and look at the wealth that they have in the relationships rather than the wealth, wealth that they're trying to generate outside of the family, mainly because of COVID, where people have kind of realised that, oh, I miss my mum and dad and I want to be close to my mum and dad, or mm-hmm. in my case, I want to be close to my kids. Um, and whether they would forego independence, why? I wonder why that is so valued as in being independent if you're with your family that you get on with, if you don't get on with your family. <laughs> well, in, independence, independence is choice, isn't it? So. Yeah. Um, it's you could you could live with your parents um, kind of until you're 45, but still have the choice. I've got friends who are uh, who are mid to late 40s living with with a family who are happy as you like, yeah. because they actually have all the choice in the world. Now, I would argue they're actually they have actually have more independence than those of us who are married with kids. Yeah. You know, yeah. so it's it, it, it's what makes people happy. I think it's very easy for it's very easy for people in different positions to um, make decisions as to how other people should should live and and be financially. It's not about that. I think it's important that people have conversations as to what is actually right for you and what do you want to get out of this. What, what is it? What are you looking to try and achieve? Yeah, yeah, and and this this is the thing is that because of the culture we're living in we have this kind of stereotype or oh, if you're still with your mum and dad by the time you're 30 oh there's something wrong with you does nobody love you you can't you can't find a partner you can't get out there yeah 50 years ago it was a spinster yeah <clears throat> bachelor get the cats out yeah 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 <laughs> and I, I don't think that's a problem now I mean one of my friends lives um she's moved back in with her mum uh, for all the right reasons her mum's in her 80s so she's looking after her and they're having a whale of a time yeah um and again she's Burmese that's her culture to look after your elderly ones and it makes me wonder why so many people you know have to put their parents in a home it's like well why are they not in your home <laughs> and, and they it's all- not it's not it's not always appropriate to um when we see the the different life cycle, the different um cycles in life that people go through on a daily basis um and a lot of things are not always financially driven um yeah. a lot of them are ability driven um I, and the ability to cope you know, um, whether whether that is growing up with young children or is growing old with old parents. Uh, in reality, it's uh, growing old with older parents is, is almost like a rever- it's an uncontrolled reversal. It's not like if you've got parents who are um, going down the Alzheimer's route, for example, or some kind of uh, degenerative uh, illness. It's an uncontrolled reversal it's not like it's not like kids that you can teach them to do their shoelaces up or teach them to use a knife and fork and so it's it's very there's different stages in people's lives and it's important not to assume what's going on with other people um, and assume that just because someone's in a similar uh, a similar stage of life to you or you know everybody's got their stuff going on and very few people present it openly and honestly Um, you know, so you look at the social media thing, nobody, nobody sits there and starts with actually what's going on. You know, they, <laughs> people yeah. generally go, oh, isn't this great? Isn't this wonderful? Um, and yes, that is potentially slightly, um, slightly um, kind of um, uh, positive toxicity, if you like. But it's, mm. oh, I, I don't know. I, I, I would always start from the start point. Don't make any assumptions. Ask. Oh, absolutely. And I think individual cases, absolutely. Everybody's got their own individual case and it, you've got to do what's best for you. My concern is that um, generalizations and culture seems to be um, that you, um, when you have children, uh, they get to a certain age and you put them into care, <laughs> care home, you put them into um, nursery, you, put yeah, them yeah. Into, you know, so from the age of some, some children, six weeks old are going in, you know, while their parents have to go to earn money. Um, yeah. And the idea of working out how you can survive on one salary rather than, no, 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 they both have to go to work because they want two holidays or three holidays a year. So we can't afford not to go. Yeah, but so I know I know are. loads of adults. I know loads of adults who don't want to be, who don't want to be full-time childcare. That doesn't make them bad parents. That, exactly. Um, I, also know, I also know parents who've both taken paternity, to, paternity leave off because they both want to, um, want to kick around and it, and it's it's do you know what the most important thing is if you're going to um having kids is doing what you want to do because there's so much opinion 
I mean, everybody throws, it's one of those, one of those times in your life where everybody gives you opinion. It's like, whoa, hang on a minute. Mm. Go away. Let me work it out for myself. That you know, so true. But what, what get, well, the point I was trying to make is that even from a very early age, the, the culture is your kid goes into nursery and in the, at the other end of the scale, your mom and dad will go into a care home. You know, are yeah. your mom in a care? Oh yeah, my mom's in a care home. Oh yeah, because it's, that's what we do. And it actually, whoa, stop, stop, stop. There are so many other permutations that you can build into your life that isn't focused around money, that, that isn't yeah, about you know, how we can finance it. And I, I agree with you, David. It is um, every individual's got to make their own choice, but to make an empowered choice and not a choice that they feel that this is what everybody else does. So if you're a 35 year old male still living with your mom and dad, don't be ashamed about that. That's lovely. That's really kind. It's like it's looking after them. They looking after you. It's a mutually convenient situation and you absolutely have joy about it yeah there's no negative around that I don't think um talking about growing up um now you kind of got to a level where you've kind of you know, you've got, I understand you've got a place in France that you go to you've got your place in London that you you know, looking back on your life now now with the benefit of hindsight what would you say to your 16 year old self what piece of advice would you give them to help them to cope with whatever you were coping with at 16 was it like i thought a... you were going to say now that you've grown up that's what you were meant no to... no you're, i don't think you'll ever grow up <laughs> i wasn't going to make that mistake <laughs> please um, don't I... grow up you won't be the same person if you did I and mean, i don't want to grow up either i said to somebody the other day who's uh, 10 years my junior when i grow up i want to be like you <laughs> mm. <laughs> she was amazing but um, yeah so what would you say to your 16 year old self what advice would you give and um, just go and do it the, the number the number of times I've heard different people say, oh, don't do this, oh, don't do that. And in reality, when they're saying that, they're pointing at themselves. They're not pointing at you. Um, and so many people are held back by other people's um, just lack of get up and go. You know, and a lot of it, a lot of it is, is uh, you know, don't do something because it might be dangerous. Um, don't do, you know, don't do this. And when I was at college, I was reading a, uh, a magazine um about uh uh i can't remember it's one of the one of the the lads magazines um mm. that i was reading in in college there was a picture of paraglider on there and um i said turn around and said i'm somebody i'm going to do that and um and they were like oh you can't do that blah 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 and then i was told by a variety of other people it's a stupid idea so i used my student loan to go and buy one <laughs> which wasn't necessarily the best thing to do <laughs> love it however Mm. however it was a really great experience you know with hindsight was that a good idea probably not um but it was a, it was a really good thing to do did uh, it's amazing i was just thinking though um did you know that one of our members had the first paragliding school in the uk no who's that yeah paul baker oh, okay does yes. he still do it um i think he does actually yeah i think he does oh. I have to give him a ring pop over to bristol um yeah, interesting, isn't it? I, I think you're right. I think a lot of people say, no, don't do it because of the, the danger. In fact, I had a daredevil friend who used to do all sorts of things until his knees started to get a bit dodgy because he was knocking on a bit. Um, but one thing he said that he would never do <clears throat> because he said you can't, um, what's the word, legislate for if things go wrong is white water rafting, um, which really? I'm sure you've done. Yeah, yeah. And I've, I've known at least three people who have, been tipped up while it's been going on um, and thought their life was over, including that chap on the telly um, that does all the daredevil stuff. And he said that he would never do it again because he nearly died while really? he was doing it. What's his name? Not Bear Grylls, the other one. The little short chap. Oh, yeah, you'll probably know his name more than me. Oh, I've forgotten his name. Anyway, yeah, white water rafting. So that's my, um, I was warned and I'm like, that's good. I was never going to do it anyway. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Yeah, you see, I, you see, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't that uh, see I'd be surprised at that uh, that sorry that surprised me I thought you were going to say something like skydiving mm -hmm. um but I mean there's uh, different people have got different perceptions of risk and are frightened of different things in different uh, different ways there's some really good some really good films um that I watched um in the last month one was for one was 14 peaks um where the guys went up and basically did 14 of the world's biggest peaks in a ridiculously quick time yeah. um i got on a q a with uh, the guy who head up who headed up the project and the one i actually asked him the 
a similar question. What would you tell your 10 year old self? Um, and his answer was that nothing is that nothing is impossible. So if you want to do it, go and try it. Mm. Don't just be told it's impossible. Mm. Um, the second film that I watched was The Rescue, which was about the cave divers and the Thai kids. Oh, yeah. And I didn't realize um, how far those guys had actually swam. I mean, it was col- like kilometers there and back mm. um, with um, with basically um, anesthetized kids. Mm. And if you watch that, you get some kind of um, just some kind of I can't actually believe you did that. Now, that to me is insanity. So when we're looking at different things, that's you're, I mean, you're absolutely mad. But these guys who were kind of slightly nerdy, lonery kind of odd odd Got guys guys yeah um, end up being phoned up because you know that the top um the top special forces in the world couldn't do what they could do and they turned up with homemade equipment and stuff they just had a very 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 um specialist uh, way of doing things a very very niche a niche skill um and they had the confidence and um it's not just confidence it, it was the mental ability to flatten out um, their emotions, to be able to, to go and physically do that. And they got every single one out. It was amazing. Um, the other one was, the other one that I watched was The Dawn Wall. And there was two climbers who were trying to climb the Dawn Wall um, in, uh, in Yosemite um, on El Capitan. And, and they got up it. Um, and it was, it, they're going through all the, the, the struggles but again they were they were tied on so I can get that I mean they're, they're obviously clearly very high they were sleeping uh, they were sleeping on a portal ledge like way up um mm-hmm. and that, I mean, there's, a, there's a really funny scene where they're lugging this bottle of pee around with them because because they were going up and down they didn't want to pee and have it go onto the the the, the, the rock so they were filling a bottle up which they carried up and down with them each time they did it it's really mm-hmm. really funny um <laughs> And then the last one, and this was where I was getting to, was a film called Free Solo, mm-hmm. where somebody free soloed right up El, El Capitan uh, in Yosemite. Wow. And it was interesting to hear the opinions of the other, the other climbers. But this guy was so... Um, um, there's, he, he was mentally built to blank out everything, relationships, stress... Mm. Uh, I mean, everything um, to the point that he even said uh, he even says at one point, I don't want you to watch me. So they want they set up remote cameras so that he wouldn't feel that he was being watched mm. because he didn't want anything to um, to, to impact or interrupt um, his concentration, his focus when he was going up. And, and he did it. Um, and it's uh, it, interesting that one of the guys who did um, the, the guy who was leading on the Dawn Wall, he said his dad always said to him. Don't free solo, so don't climb without a rope, and don't ice climb. And I was watching that thing. I'd love to ice climb. There's nothing. If you ever get a chance to do it, um, the the feeling of getting an ice axe into ice and then kicking your boots in is amazing. <laughs> it's if, if you've ever, ever got an angry bone in your body, um, <laughs> it, seriously, it's amazing. It wow. is such a good experience. Um, but that is something I'd love to do. So the only thing there that I really would never, ever do is climb without a rope. Um, mm. I mean, that's just that's just in, uh, just absolute insanity. But also, all of those things are in within their control. It's like the guy that um, whose name escapes me, the Frenchman that, that um, did the tightrope walk across the um, towers, the Twin Towers. Um, you know, it's all within their mental control. Maybe the wind might have knocked him a little bit, but generally he, it was within his control. But in a raging river, if you get flipped by the, the water and you get yeah. dragged down by the current, not a lot you can do about it. You know, you're stuck no matter what equipment yeah. or anything you've got. That was my thought around you're, you're at the um, mercy of the elements. And I think there are certain things like you, like you say, having the rope when you're going up a mountain, you know, it just takes the odds more in your favor, <laughs> even if, you know, you yeah. get stuck. It, I, I think, I think it's where you're comfortable. I mean, uh, and also if you're fit enough to do it, there'll be, there'll be yeah. people who go in canoes down things that uh, would just be just as stunning. And there'll be people that won't. Yeah. Um, yeah. Different people are, are comfortable in different environments. 
you were telling me the other day was it you that, about people going up the mountain in flip-flops um, oh I went up I went <laughs> I, I went up um Snowden on I was up in Birmingham last week on Thursday mm-hmm. and kind of decided that I wanted to go up some mountains and worked out that Snowden was two and a half hours from there so um I went up part to the bottom of uh, Snowden went up and um there was a guy up there when so I was I'd taken proper kit because I was working on the basis that it was snowing. There'd probably be nobody there. There was loads of people there yeah. um, at different bits. And uh, there was a guy at the top who had um, a T-shirt, shorts, um, and uh, I'm like, trainers on. And he literally had ice hanging off the, like, and it was a lot of ice as well, hanging off the hairs on his legs. Yeah. And when I went past, and, and this, I was on the way up. So this was about, I don't know, 50 metres to the top. Um, I said, are you all right? And he was like, yeah, yeah. And he walked past. And I got back down. So I went back up and walked a different way back down. Um, and I caught up with them um, uh, on when we get going to the car park and said, are you are you all right again? And he said, oh, I am now. And so I was like, oh, OK. So you basically you understand why you shouldn't have been up. And I mean, the weather was horrible at the top. I mean, it really was quite nasty because you get over the ridge and the way the, the wind I mean, it was like literally being sandblasted by kind mm. of wind and snow and ice. Mm. Um, and it, it just, it just absolute insanity. Had he fallen over? Oh, gosh, yeah. It wouldn't have lasted very long just because of, just because of exposure. But it's um, amazing that some people have a different, um, um, what's the word, response to the cold. Yeah, yeah, that was, yeah, that was stupidity. That wasn't, uh, yeah. he knew it. So he knew it as well. <laughs> Um, I mean, there, there was a num- there was there was lots of other people turning back halfway because it got because the, the, above a certain point um, there was quite a lot of snow and there was about three mm. foot at the top, um, so it was it was proper kind of ice axe and crampons weather and the, the problem is that so many people um, so many people will access the 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 national parks in the UK without any respect yeah. to what can actually happen and it doesn't you don't have to fall very far to break a leg. Mm. you know and these things do happen that's why we have mountain rescue uh, but it's incredibly unfair and selfish to expect mountain rescue to go up and cart a body down unnecessarily you know and, and it does happen and it's it's the same with Everest as well isn't it people still tackle that without any training or any uh, acknowledgement of the seriousness of what they're about to do and as yep. you say people have to go up there and well they leave the bodies there half the time well, they leave they them there, yeah to, bring them down but I did see a documentary talking about uh, being cold of uh, a lady that um, got the world record for swimming a mile in the uh, arctic arctic yeah she the ice mile didn't she 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 basically spent oh the best part of a year and a half two years um sitting in a freezer every day um it's just amazing I don't know I don't know how anybody can move in I mean, I, I'm quite partial to a, a cold dip, but that's a wholly <laughs> different conversation when there's proper chunks of ice. Mm. Um, even if you are a very fast swimmer, it's uh, that's enough. That's enough cold water to do serious harm to most bodies quickly. Yeah, yeah. So I, I do think there are some people made up in different ways. And I know um, it's been scientifically proven, isn't it, that most women are two degrees or four degrees colder than most men on average. Um, so which is why we always want to turn the thermostat on. Just putting it out there. Um, so your 16 year old self, um, if you were to talk to him now, what and you said, oh, by the way, I've done this thing. What do you think your 16 year old self would be most impressed by with all the all the brave and crazy exploits that you've been up to in the last few years? Um, do you know what? I don't actually think any of it. Really? Um, I would actually have said, get on and do it all sooner. Why have you waited so long? Oh, wow. Did you want to do stuff like that at 16? Oh, we did loads of stuff. Well, we didn't have rules back then. Yeah. So, I mean, I I found um, I found the route maps for um, uh, for for the trips that we did when we did uh, Queen's Gate, which is effectively gold gold DV. Um, And you just wouldn't be allowed to do that now. Oh, just because they have they just have rules called health and safety. But we used to do all sorts of stuff that you just wouldn't be allowed to do without proper permits. And um, I think we were, there just wasn't, there wasn't the, the environment of health and safety that there are, the fact is very fact it's called health and safety. Mm. I mean, back then it was pretty called excitement because it was, it was great. And it was normal to go camping down beside the river or, you know, swim across to an island in the Thames and 
just dodgily light a campfire in there and cook sausages and then go home yeah. afterwards. I mean, that was just normal. We'd never, you'd never get away with that now. Crazy, isn't it? So do yeah. you feel sorry for your kids now that they won't be able to do the same things that you did? Um, they, well, no, they can do. I mean, they, they, there's things, there's things that I'm pushing my kids to do now, which I definitely wasn't pushed to. Mm. Um, I had Saffron um, lead climbing or uh, last weekend. So I was teaching her to, to, to basically lead or basically go up and set the kit up on the wall herself. Mm. Um, and she went straight up the first time, did it absolutely perfectly. I'd obviously set up safety ropes and stuff because I don't want her to have a bad experience. No. no. Um, but she went straight up. Now, I, was ne- I would never in a million years be encouraged to do that. Um, and it, it's odd. In that there's certain things that um, if I don't push her too hard, she's really keen. Um, but if I take it too seriously, she's like, nope, not doing it. Um, so she needs to be encouraged, but not yeah. pushed in the demanding parent. But I, 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 my wife also keeps pointing out, well, hang on, you're doing these all these things with the kids that you want to do. Do they want to do it? Yeah. So they need to be encouraged that it's their decision. Yeah, absolutely. One of the Basically. things that I always used to say to my husband is find the thing that the thing that they are into at that particular time and get involved yeah. with that because that's yeah. when you have great conversations with your kids. So although he had the bike and he wanted to go cycling down by the river, um, the kids weren't that keen initially. And then when the youngest one said, dad, can we cycle to Bishop Stalkford? It's, it's only seven miles. And he said, yeah, okay, well, along the river, it's a lot longer. <laughs> so, but they would do that, you know, that was their things, the two of them. And the yeah, older yeah. one was really into collecting different stuff. So, and he liked markets. So he would like take her to different markets so she could collect like, um, car boot sales and stuff so she could collect her little things that she wanted to collect and then he would be teaching her about so if you buy two of those uh, how, how much cheaper is it than if you bought one and all this kind of thing so now she's grown up to to appreciate a blooming good bargain yeah um, which brings us all the way back to money again funnily um but it is finding out what they're into and also even if you're not into it you've got to do it anyway to a certain extent just to so our kids, would, yeah. you know, one term it was trampolining, next time it was ballet, then it was drama, then it was netball, then it was, and a lot of it has stuck. But at the same time, we got involved as well. So, yeah. you know, we got to know their mates um, and we had stuff, you know, come back as well to the house. And so whenever they said, oh, so-and-so's mum says they can, I'm like, I spoke to so-and-so's mum and she can't. Mm. <laughs> so you really got to encapsulate all of them rather than that this is what daddy does let's go and do that today do we have to um and it it builds bonds for life so what you're doing it sounds absolutely fantastic Um, and do you see a difference in the personality of the two uh yeah so um saffron's a bit more there's i mean they like two different things um saffron is much easier to push but she's older Mm -hmm. uh xander has picked up too many of the let's do this safely you know he picks out if saffron says she doesn't want to do it he picks up that very quickly um but then he you know he's he'll he'll do anything really he doesn't he just he's picking stuff up because he's picking stuff up because he's he's four um he doesn't actually know why he doesn't want to do stuff yet he'll just say he doesn't want to do it yeah um but they'll they'll grow out of that but but also it's a great space for him to learn what his boundaries are to go well no actually this this is this is my no way island i'm not going to push myself but then yeah. sometimes it's like, well, it's like with food, isn't it? And I know you're a great one for getting them to be adventurous as well with food. Um, it's always that sort of space. And we used to say to our kids with food, you might not like it today, but you might like it tomorrow. So give it a yeah. go. Uh, and it's having this yeah, yeah. spirit of adventure, isn't it? Around, you know, go on, just try. You never, you, you can't tell if you like something until you, you try it. But um, they need to try different things. It's important. I mean, if you go to if you want a holiday somewhere or go to somebody's house and they feed you great, granted they're unlikely to feed you snails and frog legs and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But I think it is incredibly important to be open-minded enough to know, you know, what, what different things are. So Saffron will go into the cheese shop and she'll order, you know, a a, a plate of different cheeses and by proper name. Whereas Zander's still at the change, you'll walk, still at the sorry stage, you'll walk in and say, I, I want that one because it's yellow. He likes yellow cheese. Um, <laughs> and it's uh, whatever, if that works for me, it's four, you know, they'll grow up. But it's important to try different things and mm-hmm. um, and learn what they like and learn learn what they don't like. If they don't like something, that's cool. It's not a problem. But don't sit there and go, I don't like it just because your mate said that. That's ridiculous. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, so many people get caught up in that, don't they? Yeah. So adults as well. You know, I, 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 I know some adults very well who, if you offered them an olive, um, you know, they, they would literally turn their face up and it's just like, why not? You know? Yeah. My daughter, you know? um, from a very young age, loved olives. And then all of a sudden you get to that certain age where apparently olives are not cool anymore. So she stopped eating them. And when she was doing drama, she had to uh, eat them every night as part of this show that she was in for a whole week. So I said, at the end of it, you're going to love them. It's going to be great. And at the end of it, she went, no, I still hate them. And then ironically, when she got this boyfriend and he said, oh, you should try more olives. You, you really like them because I love them. And then he he went out of his way to find other ones that would, you know, try, yeah, try funny, this one that you've not tried before. And all of a sudden now she loves olives. So, so it's what was your late. motivation? What was the true motivation for liking or disliking, actually? Mm. Yeah, sometimes we just don't realise, do we? Because there's, no, yeah. there's nothing in an olive to dislike, really, is there? Thinking about your kids one finally, um, and the way the uh, financial industry is going, and we've talked a little bit about mortgages and how it's good to get on the ladder at some point in any which way you can. Do you think, just moving the parameters slightly, what's the world going to be like maybe in 20 years' time with Bitcoin for the future of the financial services? And do you think our kids are going to be buying bitcoin in the same way and, and cash will be gone do you, uh, can you foresee this is what's going to happen i don't gen, 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 what I gen, golden ball, gen, you know. genuinely genuinely don't know um mm. i if you look at the way that kids have checked the, the way that kids um are able to um use and manipulate um uh, it and electronics and you know a, a variety of platforms and interfaces um the way they can do it is is so much more intuitive um than it was for my generation mm. um you know you'll have you'll have people who are in their 80s who will struggle to use a tv remote control these days you'll have a three month a, a six month old baby who will in, you know instinctively have seen parent do this on a phone and know what to do. I mean, it's just, it's just insanity. They're so, they're so intuitive. They're, they're clued in in a different way. Um, so the way that money is handled will change. Um, you know, bef before, before COVID, for example, um, the percentage of transactions that were done, you know, on mobile phones or, um, or, you know, just um, by touching a card were a lot less. It's now seen as a convenience. You know, if you walk in and someone says, oh, you've got to stick it in and press a number. You're like, why? Yeah. You know, it just doesn't make sense. So, and it's something that simple. So it's going to change. And whether it's bit in 20 years, whether it's Bitcoin or whether it's, uh, um, there was a film whereby you uh, you basically had a, a number on your wrist and um, you put your hand that way to download it and then that way to, to pick it up. And yeah. it, I mean, it could be a chip in your hand at some point, you know, that it'll be it will definitely be different to what it is now will it be cashless probably mm. to a large extent because do we need cash no um it comes down to value i mean whether that's carrots or potatoes it's still value isn't it you know do you mm. buy a house for 150,000 potatoes or 150,000 carrots it's 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 still a um, a barterable or tradable figure mm. so it'll definitely be different but whether it'll be bitcoin or or any of the, the electronic currencies and how that will be managed. I've absolutely no idea. Mm. It's we're coming to a, um, a juncture, aren't we, of, of things moving in a, a different direction. And what concerns me is the, uh, the security around all this electronic, you know, value that we have in, in a piece of plastic. Yeah. It's so easy for us to get hacked these days and scanned at the same time. Yeah, and it, but it, it goes on. I mean, all of that goes on a regular basis. Um, mm -hmm. Whilst financial services has become a lot more um, fraud savvy and money laundering savvy, uh, in reality, it's as easy as it ever was to sit and abuse the system. Um, mm -hmm. And what actually happens behind the scenes is that a lot of the companies are effectively just writing off a certain amount of um, of, uh, of fraud and abuse to the system because they know it's going to happen. Mm. Um, they know that they can't get rid of 100% of it. And I mean, even if you bring up the big, the, the big cards, um, they, will, they will basically just drop a certain value. I mean, I've had it before. I've had it before. I was in, um, 
uh, I was in Sainsbury's, I think, and somebody rung up and uh, my bank rung up and said, um, have you just been shopping? And it was someone like Ilford. Like, so the other other side of town was like, well, clearly not, because I've just mm. been in Sainsbury's where I live. Mm. Um, and and it's not actually physically possible for me to get there geographically in that time. Um, and they said, oh, well, your card must have been cloned. It's being used elsewhere. Yes. Um, and there wasn't even a question. They just nullify the transaction so someone's obviously had the value of whatever it was they bought um but they just wiped it off and said it's not worth us it's not worth us um um chasing it so yeah so it will still happen but banks obviously put it down to the margin of uh, margin of their costs yeah it makes you wonder the more because apparently the pandemic has created much more um hacking like this um so so many per second blah 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 you know thousands probably millions now, that the banks are going to come to a point where they can't say, I'll write that off. Um, and whether yeah. it's, you know, I don't know where it's going to lead. It's, it, you, I feel like in the next 10 years, maybe even five, things are going to have to change radically. And whether people, I, I would mm-hmm. imagine some of the older generation will just go back to shoving their cash under the mattress and hoping for the best before uh, we're told that yeah, not I'm, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people still do. Mm. Um, I mean, I, I know a lot of people still do. At the end of the day, there, there will be a tradable value in some way, shape or form. Um, and whatever that is, it, it, it'll work. Um, mm. It'll only work as long as everybody who is trading that gives it value. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I think to a certain extent, we've got so much already in our world. We don't need to keep consuming and producing anymore. We can just... No, we don't. Know, stick with what we've got i know a lot of my friends now are just not bothering to buy clothes and they go look i've got 30 years worth of clothes in the wardrobe i could do with squeezing into a few more of them but um they, they kind of don't see the need and become inventive which is where the likes of um these swapping agencies are, are useful so i think there's a different mindset around money and wealth um in in the way that people don't have a need for it it's beginning it's like it's a, a seed that's been sown and people aren't striving for it anymore they're striving for a quality of life they're striving mm-hmm. for deeper connections and they're striving for building better relationships because that means it's a means to then people are in different stages in their lives um people who the, the the wealthiest people in the world tend to be the ones who want to to have the the balancing and mental freedom uh, and choice Mm. Um, whereas people on the other, if you were looking at people who are you know, starving in, um, in certain countries, they would think that freedom of choice was being able to eat today. Yeah. You know, so it's, it, it's, it's very easy to be generic, but it's not, it's mm. different. There's different people are in different situations every day. Mm. Um, and, and that's it. Mm. Well, we've covered a lot of ground today, Mr. Liddell. Thank you very much. I'm just looking at all of the bits and pieces <clears throat> that we looked at <clears throat> excuse me today one thing i'd just like to ask you what is your earliest childhood memory um uh, probably one of the earliest would be oh party I, either parties in the garden um where my parents used to live there was lots of families there and uh, just having lots of kids so birthday parties in the garden probably Mm. um alternatively um when i was younger the first star wars films came out and uh i got a millennium falcon um so that would definitely be an earliest that was great i actually saw some millennium falcons in uh, the lego shop a couple of weeks ago i was like oh my god how much are those that was just ridiculous (laughs) i was like wow um yeah that's the modern mentality for you isn't it in this this collectible age um, oh, I love the fact that your birthday parties were outdoors. Yeah, they were always out, they were always outdoors, and it, and in September in Scotland as well. It was it was just it, we spent so much time um, outdoors because, well, I guess looking back on it and having kids now, they put the mess outside is much more sensible. <laughs> um, but yeah. It's, um, but yeah, it, we were always outside. But that must have planted the seed for you for your kind of view on life about getting out there and getting being oh, part maybe. of nature. Maybe, maybe. it's interesting. Maybe. Well, thank you so much for the conversation. We've, we've come sort of full circle. Um, interesting that I think working in, as you say, mentally all week long in the financial industry and then getting out there and just kind of being physical and, and letting, releasing all that tension of all that, the, the deep thinking that you have to do at work. I think that's a really good lesson for all of us. 
um, because no matter what job you're doing, trying to go 180 degrees in the opposite direction is a perfect way to give a holistic, healthy lifestyle. So not necessarily what, in the opposite direction. It doesn't necessarily need to be in the, in necessarily in the opposite. It's just it's just it's it's good to have a change in the opposite direction as opposed to if you're using your brain all day long go and be physical yeah. and if you're being physical yeah. all day long go and do something that's using your brain um but yeah it's it's um it's a really good insight into how you live your life um and how you help so many people um and obviously collaboration is at the heart of what you do and who you are otherwise you wouldn't be with part of our community as well so thank you for being in the community david we love having you here and thank you for that podcast um and we'll see you soon. If anybody is here uh, and wants to meet David, you can meet him at a Collaboration Global session, always the last Tuesday of the month. Uh, you, can, you can find us on Eventbrite, or you can also um, go to collaborationglobal.org and you can book the meetings there. David, if somebody wants to have a chat with you about scouts or the great outdoors or marathons or even mortgages and finance, <laughs> what's the easiest way to get hold of you? And um, either go onto our website, um alternatively um you can get hold of me through the platform collaboration global platform that's probably the easiest way what's the website uh littleparrot.com that's p-e-r-r-e-t-t yeah.com or you can find me on social media fairly easily yes or link to google my name the quickest one it's pretty obvious (laughs) lovely thank you very much david i appreciate that we'll see you next time take care lovely see you bye